your true feelings. It's okay to have uh, questions. It's okay to have sorrow. It's okay. God, you, you are all powerful. God, you are on your throne. God, you've got this. I am praising you. And I'm also going to remember your faithfulness. It said when, when he cried to him, he heard. God hears you. And the God, Scripture tells us the God who is faithful in our past will continue to be faithful in our present and in our future. And I look back at all the times in my life where it was like, God, I, I, I need you. God, I need you to show up through, through deaths in the family, different financial situations, whatever it is, where it's like, God, I need you. And he showed up, and he was faithful. And I've got to trust that that God who was faithful in the past is going to be faithful here today. So that's my challenge to you guys. And as we're getting ready for service to start, I want you to write this down. Write your own lament. Whether it's right now, these couple minutes before service starts, or, or maybe it's a little later today, but I want you to get with God and write down your own lament. Cry out to him, speak your true feelings, ask for his help, and then close by, by praising him and remembering his faithfulness. So thank you guys uh, for tuning in. We love you. I just want to remind you before service starts, if you do need prayer at any time during service, we've got this number at the bottom of the screen. You can call and get live prayer. Uh, but tune in the next couple minutes. Service will be free. Bye, guys. Staying faithful through giving is as easy as one, two, three with PushPay, Calvary's electronic giving system. Number one, visit calvarystl.org or choose from two ways with your mobile device. Either text GIVE to 31352 to get a link or go to our mobile app and tap GIVE. Then once you're on our giving page, select your campus from the drop-down menu. Two, fill out all the information, such as giving amount, giving type, and whether or not you want this gift to repeat. Three, choose to add bank account info. Why? Giving directly from your bank account maximizes your gift. Giving with a bank card or credit card can take up to 3% of your gift for a credit card company. Giving from your bank directly to Calvary Chapel allows your gift to have the greatest impact. Look, you just gave. Hey Calvary family, if you live in the local Fort Lauderdale area, we want to let you know that the grill here at Calvary Chapel Fort Lauderdale is open for you. That's right, if you're home with kids, you're home alone and don't want to cook, or you're checking out the Daniel Fast, you can visit calvarygrill.org to check out the menu. And for the first time ever, we're offering curbside pickup, so you can call in your order or place it online, but we can't wait to serve you. So check out calvarygrill.org. Hey, Calvary family, we just wanted to let you know that while we are not gathering together at our campuses for worship, we have the chance to gather online and worship Jesus and hear his word together. And that's the blessing of technology. There's also a phone number you can call. It's 954-977-9673. And it's a chance for you just to, to call again and just say, hey, I need someone to pray for me. I'm feeling anxious or fearful. And here's what we're excited about. We know this coronavirus is going to come and it's going to pass. And so one day soon, we're going to be together face-to-face -to -face, worshiping Jesus, and we can't wait for that day. We will see you soon. Hey, guys, I'm Jared Stefani. And I'm Laura Stefani. And we just want to encourage you that during these challenging times, take every opportunity to draw closer to Jesus, but also continue to love on those around you. Here's one way to draw close to Jesus. Pray with us each day for our 21 days fast. And here at FTL.org, three times a day, 7 a.m., noon, and 7 p.m. And be sure to share the daily prayers on Facebook and Instagram. We also want to encourage you to find strength in community. Yes, join over the 15,000 people watching church online through our website on Wednesdays and the weekends. Start a watch party during service times on Facebook. Just click share to start one and interact with friends and family. And join a group. Groups are now online, and it's bringing us together like never before. We do need to distance, but don't isolate. Go to joinagroup.org. We're family. We can do this together. And as we're all finding encouragement together, we're also getting into the story unlike ever before. We've already heard amazing stories of how many of you are taking prayer walks in your neighborhoods. You're dropping off food and gift cards on your way back from the grocery store. And we're dropping off much-needed medical supplies. Way to go, Calvary. To see how you can help our community right now, go to calvaryftl.org slash coronavirus. 
On there, you'll see all of our latest updates, including quick access to our COVID-19 relief outreaches. So let's look for ways to support our community and those that are serving on the front lines during this crisis. So be sure to go to calvaryftl.org slash coronavirus to see how you can make a tangible difference and get in the story right now. We're so glad you're with us in this time, Calvary family. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus and love well. We'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Calvary Chapel's online community. My name is Kelly, and I'm so glad that we all get to be together for our weekend service today. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to invite you to text the word NEW to 31352 or visit calvaryftl.org slash NEW to let us know that you're checking out our church so that we can connect with you and hear more about you. Also, if you're online today and you're needing to talk with someone or ask for prayer, we would love to pray with you. You can either chat in the group to tell them that you need prayer, or you can call the number below and somebody would love to pray for you. We have teams ready now that are waiting for your call. Now today, we're going to spend time worshiping together just like we normally would in person. And we're also going to be in God's word together. Pastor Doug's going to be starting a new series about the miracles of Jesus, and we are excited about what God is going to show us in his word. So wherever you are, get ready. Here we go. so excited that we get to worship together. I don't know where you find yourself, but I don't want you to be shy, but feel like you can lift up a shout of praise and declare that he's the king of glory. Come on. bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name over all and Jesus reigns. Come on, will you sing it? Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound just one day over all Jesus reigns. 
You get to declare that he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And we don't have to fear anything, whatever is going on. We don't have to fear, but we know that we are victorious because he's victorious. Come on, just sing through a shout of praise to him. Just bring him praise. our gaze upon you again today, Father. There's none like you. We remember you as we worship. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. Sing it together. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Yes, you are. And age to age. Age to age he stands. And time is in his hands. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. Yes. The Godhead three
God is great. The psalmist says he's greatly to be put in his great, greatness is unsearchable. As if to say, we're not even going to be able to unravel the depths of his greatness, his faithfulness and goodness toward us. I just want to read part of Psalm 24. We sang it in the first song, that he's a king of glory. And I want to show you where it comes from. Because in a second, we're going to just hail him as king. Lift him high above all of the things we see. Here's what it says in Psalm 24. It says, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. It says, lift your head, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? It asks again. And the answer, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. We believe as we worship that the King Jesus, he's in our midst, he's with you. And to hail the King, here's what it means. It means to give attention where it's due and respect where it's due. To fix your eyes on the person that deserves it the most. So no matter what's going on in your house, we're going to hail King Jesus. We're going to lift him up. We're going to give him the praise he's worthy of. Because no matter what's happening in your house or your neighborhood or your county, Jesus is still king of the county. He is still king of the nation. He's still king of our, our world. You have no reason to be afraid if the king is a benevolent king, and he is. Oh, he is. So we're going to just do something really quick. I want you to repeat after me, okay? Want, wherever you are, I want you to say this. I want you to say, I am a citizen of a heavenly kingdom that cannot be shaken, and the king loves me. Say it again, and the king loves me. Yeah, we're going to just fix our eyes on Jesus right now and hail him as king. He's good, and he will never stop being good. Amen. When it was a moment when the lights went out And the death had claimed its victory The king of love had given darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens roared all hail King Jesus Oh! 
So we will trust in you, God. And you reign over all, Lord. 
Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we are just thankful, we're humbled, and we acknowledge you as our Lord and as our Savior. And at a time like this, Lord, it's just, we're, we're put in a position where we have no other place to look but to you, Lord. We're thankful that you are our Father, Lord. And as some of us walk through darkness, we are just, uh, we're thankful that we have a Father that can comfort us, that can give us peace in this time when we just have uncertainty. We don't know what's happening with uh, with the world that's happening today, with some of us with our jobs, with our families, and many of us just uh, in our homes, just looking around and seeking, Lord. We, we pray for those who don't know you, that there will just be a spiritual awakening in all the homes that are happening. And for those who've known you, maybe maybe walked away, maybe putting our, our trust in other things, Lord, that this will be a time for revival, Lord. We pray today that you can just help us put away distractions, that you can speak to us today, and that we can see you in a new way as we hear about just the miracles that you've done as you walk this earth that you continue to do today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, Calvary family. My name is Steve, and I have the pleasure of being our campus pastor on our Parkland campus. And so shout out to our Parkland family and all of our campuses if you're watching us online. Uh, we love you, and we are still with you here. We're thankful that you joined us. Uh, here at Calvary, we have a mission. And our mission is to reach our community and to change our world. And a few different ways that we can do that. In reaching our community, we have something that we call online groups. And if you're not in one today, many of you have been a part of community groups in the past in person. Well, now in the situation that we're in, we're, we're kind of a scattered church, but we can still be gathered through our online community. And so if you go to joinagroup.org, uh, we believe that we are better together. And there are so many different places, whether you're a man, a woman, a youth, or even married couples, uh, we have a group for you. And so join us at joinagroup.org and pray about where God's leading you to be a part of a group. Uh, the other thing we want to just thank you for is all of our, our, our faithful givers out there. We thank you for continuing to be a part of the mission that Calvary is doing. Uh, again, part of reaching our community and changing our world is continuing to give to our mission. We can do that through calvaryftl.org, uh, through PushPay and many different online options. Uh, but we are just so thankful for your heart to give. We believe that giving is an act of worship here at Calvary Chapel. And so we're thankful that you continue to trust our Lord and Savior with, the, with, the, with what he's blessed us with. And so today is going to be an exciting uh, time that you've joined us. We are actually starting a brand new series where we're going to hear about the miracles of Jesus. And so if you would, uh, check out this video as we prepare to study God's word together. Miracles. Heaven is waiting to break through as you look with expectation. Can you see? message, the person behind it all, he is the God of miracles. Hey, Calvary family, we are so grateful that you are joining us in living rooms and houses all across South Florida and all around the world. And today, we're in a new series called Miracles. We're also in the middle of our 21-day fast. And it's not a coincidence, this miracle series, this 21-day fast, this idea of God breaking through is something God placed on our hearts months ago. And now, it's so relevant for the moment that we're in. I mean, for me, as I got this journal mailed to me this week and just began to write down some of those breakthroughs that, that I personally need, my family needed, that, that our city needs, it's amazing to watch as God is already starting to answer some of those prayers in ways that we didn't expect. And so, church, we want to invite you to be a part of this miracle series, a part of this 21-day prayer and fast, and, and be asking God, what is that area of breakthrough in my life? Now, today we're going to be in Mark chapter 9. So if you have a Bible, grab it, open it up. Wherever you are, again, we'd love for you to join us with a Bible in your hand. And as you find that place, uh, we all want to take a deep breath and just kind of collectively exhale, because it's been a 
a busy week. And so we want a little comic relief. So uh, the memes keep on coming. So we're just going to take a moment to look at some of the favorite memes from the week. Uh, this one's great. Uh, thoughts and prayers go out to all the married men who've spent months telling their wives, I'll do that when I have time. Oh. Well, guys, you have plenty of time. Your excuses are done. Now, if you're a germaphobe and you're constantly washing your hands, well, this one's for you. Uh, how am I doing? Well, I just wiped down the container of Lysol wipes with a Lysol wipe. So I'm fine. So everything's fine. Yeah, just keep wiping everything down. You'll be just fine. And then finally, uh, it's this one. Where two or more are gathered, but less than ten. And that's kind of the place we're in here as a city and even as a nation as we try to figure out this new sense of normal. But I also wanted to say in this moment where some of us are going stir crazy because we're in the house and we don't know what to do. There's a whole other group of people who are working harder than you've ever worked in your life. And as your pastor, I just want to say, I am so proud of you. I mean, we're still on mission. Though we might think so many things have changed, our mission is still clear. We're here to make disciples. We're here to reach our city and change our world. And so many of you got so creative, even in the missions that we've been giving you, to get to know your neighbors and to pass out groceries, and, and, and pass out toilet paper, and hand sanitizer, and, and, and even more than that, we're watching some such creative outreaches, because for our first responders, for those who work in the medical field, there's a need uh, for masks, there's a need for supplies, and, and our plantation uh, women's group got together, and they, they did a bunch of uh, masks that they were able to pass out to the hospitals, and they were sewing them themselves, and just the creativity behind that, there was a, a generous a uh, donor in our community who, who donated 9,000 masks. We were able to deliver those as well this week. And then there was an outreach that we passed out. Some of our pastors went to a hospital and passed out more of these masks for those on the front line. And it's just beautiful to see this expression. But it's not just masks. Uh, we have a chance to feed people who, who are both hungry and people who are just, they're just, they don't have time to even get a meal. So, so Donovan uh, from our plantation campus, he delivered uh, pizzas to the hospital, and then he's over delivering pizzas uh, to these other places with, uh, that are in need, the fire department and, and police departments. We're actually taking our Calvary Grill, that's this incredible restaurant, and, and using it now to, to feed people that are first responders. Uh, last night at, at 10 o'clock, we're feeding police officers who are getting off shift. And when we're looking forward to, to feeding those people who are serving to get off at 10, 11 o'clock at night that just need a good meal. And so it's a, an opportunity, again, just to be generous. Our goal is to feed 1,000 families over the next several weeks. Our goal is to deliver masks and the needs of first responders over the next several weeks. And, and your gener generosity actually helps us do that. And so we just want to remind you, if you want to give above and beyond what your normal offerings and tithes are to Calvary, we have this generosity opportunity. You can go onto our website uh, under Relief and Restoration, and you can give or, or you can do something. You can join the initiative to feed our city. You can join the initiative to, to make or deliver more masks to our first responders. But again, I just want to say thank you, because this offer of generosity in a time of such uncertainty in a time when people are hoarding and people are only thinking about themselves, you are thinking about the city. And so let's, let's just pray for a moment and ask God just to align our hearts to his spirit of generosity for our city. And then we'll look into his word to see what he has to say to us today. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you that you are a generous God. And that you continue to give. And as, as we give as an act of worship, as a response to your generosity, your reputation grows. People look to the church and they say, you know, I don't know what those churches do when they meet in a building, but now I knew when, know what they do when they go out into a city. We, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And so, Father, show us how we can be generous this week with a neighbor, with a friend, with someone we've never met before. God, give us creative ideas. And help us to go on this great mission to, to reach our city with the gospel. That Jesus' people could know you. They could know the hope they can find in you alone. And now as we read your word together, we pray you would teach us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So as we begin this, this series on miracles, I want you to think about your response to the word miracle. When you hear the word miracle, what, what comes to your mind? 
I think for some people, the word miracle, they conjure up this image of this, this con man on TV. And he's using his religious authority to, to, to prey on people who are naive or who are weak-minded. If he can get enough money by peddling these phony miracles, then he can, he can make it in his life. And there's, there's that sense of miraculous that's been hijacked by people who are imposters. But then for, for some of you, when you hear the word miracle, you don't think of that imposter. You think of, of that miracle that you've been longing for, but it never happened. And so you sort of have this cynical idea about miracles. You know, people, I don't think it's really real or it's not real for me. And then there's a group of people who, who when, when I say miracle, you're like, you know what? I, I know that God did a miracle in my life. 20 years ago, I know he did a miracle at this moment in my life because there's, there's actually no explanation for, for what happened. There's no way to explain what God did. For some of you, you just experienced a miracle in this last year, and it's so real and so alive to you. And, and again, it's one of those things that, that defies explanation. And, and I want to share with you just a simple definition of the word miracle. It's a surprising event that cannot be explained by the laws of nature. You can only say it's, it's otherworldly. I don't understand how it happened. This divine intervention. And, and if you think about that word extraordinary or impossible or, or divine, you look, look back at the root word in Latin of the word miracle. It is object of wonder. That the word miracle actually meant object of wonder. It caused you to scratch your head and go, wait a second, did that really happen? And if you go even farther back to the root word of miracle, it means to smile. Which means when you experience a miracle, you smile. It's almost like, like you're surprised by God. I don't know if you've ever been surprised for maybe a, a 30th or 50th birthday party or, or your friends put something together and you're just like blown away and you're like, they got me. You're surprised by wonder. Well, when you have one of those moments where you sort of walk away and scratch your head and smile to yourself like, man, they got me. And it was amazing. I can't believe they love me that much. They, they did that special thing for me. That's what happens when we experience a miracle from God. And so in the middle of our 21-day fast, as we're praying God bring a breakthrough, maybe we should be praying God surprise me. God amaze me because I'm praying for a breakthrough for this person or that person. Is there an area of your life where, where you need a breakthrough? You need a miracle? Because if you're watching this and you're like, I need a miracle. There's really good news in the Bible and from the story we're going to read. Here's what Jesus said from his own lips. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And here's the problem. The problem is maybe not that we don't believe that God can work, but 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 it's the situation that we're in. And so, so here's what, what we know about miracles, that everyone wants to experience a miracle, but none of us want to be in a position to need one. And that is the case of the man that we're going to read about in Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, we're about to meet a desperate father. And he needs a miracle in such a desperate way. He doesn't want to be in this position, but... Frankly, he is, and maybe you're thinking in life, you don't want to be in the position you're in right now because the last month has seemed like it's changed almost everything in your life. Then maybe you can relate with this desperation. So, so Mark chapter 9 starts out on the mountaintop. Jesus takes three of his best friends, Peter, James, and John, to the top of this mountain, and he is transfigured before them. He shows them this image of his glory. From the inside out, he, he shines as bright as the sun. And Moses and Elijah are there. There's this great conversation. And then Jesus says to Peter, James, and John, shh, don't tell any, anyone about this. And it's almost like that they see this amazing thing that, that blows their mind, and they walk down the mountain going, I can't believe we got to see that. And there's this sort of intimate kind of conversation that just we know about this. And as they walk down from that mountaintop, they walk straight to an argument. It's a chaotic scene. And this is so much like life, right? You have these mountaintop moments with God, and then it seems like you walk into your family room, your living room, and there's this chaotic moment. And, and this is what Jesus walks into. Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. And when Jesus came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. And immediately when he saw them, 
all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, they greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He, He gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Jesus and these three disciples go from this beautiful mountaintop experience to this absolutely chaotic moment. They they see an argument. The whole crowd rushes to Jesus. He goes, what's going on? And you have the religious disciples or the religious leaders who are having this argument. Maybe maybe they're talking about the theology of miracles and and how God could heal someone with a mute spirit. The disciples that that had cast out demons and healed before were unable to, to help this This man, they they were unsuccessful. And then you have this desperate father in this moment. He needs a miracle, but he doesn't want to be in the position to need one. And now he is desperate. So Jesus responds in verse 19. O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And then we're going to watch Jesus walk through a process with this father. Because this miracle is not just about this young boy who's writhing around on the ground and in, in very suicidal situations. But this miracle is, is aimed straight at this father because Jesus is after something in this father's life. And isn't that how a lot of miracles work? We're praying for a miracle for someone close to us, but it's really about us that God wants to do something in our hearts and with our faith. And so here's what happens next. Verse 20. So they brought the boy to Jesus, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And you look at this moment and you're like, This doesn't seem like compassionate Jesus. Jesus watches this boy fall down and writhe and foam at the mouth and and just sort of of watches him. And then he says to the father, how how long has he been like this? And you're thinking, what kind of question is that? Why, Why doesn't Jesus just walk over and put his hands in this boy that is so clearly not at peace and just say, be healed? But again, Jesus is going after something in this father's heart because you've you've probably never been so desperate that if you needed a miracle for someone you loved, then you you couldn't come through for them. I mean, if if you're a parent, you know this. Probably the worst feeling in the world is having a son or a daughter that you love, that you would do anything for, that you would die for, and, and you're helpless to help them. I mean, this this father said he'd been like this since a child. They've probably taken him to to doctors. They've probably given him a different diet. They've they've probably taken him to priests. They've probably prayed over him, and, and, and nothing has happened. And you have this desperation. It's like the the faith of this father is is fading away. And I don't know if you've ever been in that moment where you're like, I feel like I'm I'm drowning and just being overwhelmed and trying to keep my son safe. And I don't know if he's gonna throw himself in the fire the next minute. And I pray, and nothing happens, and people give me advice, and it doesn't help, and it just seems to be getting worse. And this sinking feeling that can happen if you've ever been in this place of desperation. And maybe you have that sinking feeling right now because you don't know about your job. You don't know about your future. You don't know about what your kids are going to do for school. You don't know about how you're going to move on. And, and Jesus is inviting a conversation, saying, if you can't breathe, If that problem is so big, you feel like you can't overcome it. I I want to be at work in that place. And so Jesus is going to, he's going to finger right in that place of pain, almost as if to say to this father, you know, you love your son, but I love your son more than you love your son, and I want to do a miracle in his life. You know that person you've been praying for? You know that family member you love, that friend you love so much? Just know this, Jesus knows them better, and he he loves them more than, than you do. 
And so we're going to watch this process of this miracle take place, and we're going to go on to verse 23. What does Jesus say next? Verse 23. So Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You can see the desperation in this moment as this father is is trying to figure out what can I do next to help my son. So before we dig into that conversation, I want you to think about just miracles in the Bible. You know, every, every miracle in the Bible has one thing in common. And I want you to think about for a second what it is. As, as you sit on your couch or uh, you're, in, you're in your kitchen, you're watching, you're listening to this. Let's see, what does every miracle in the Bible have in common? And you might say prayer, right? Because, because if people pray, that's sort of the prerequisite for a miracle. But I can show you dozens of miracles that happen when people didn't pray at all. And you would say, I, I know, faith, like Jesus encouraged this man's faith. But there were miracles that have happened in the Bible where the person who received the miracle had no faith at all, and the miracle still happened. So, so what is the one thing that every miracle in the Bible has in common? Well, it's this. Every miracle begins with a problem. So if you have a problem... Wherever you are, just, just raise your hand. Just look around. Look at the person next to you. If you're all here by yourself, we all, we all got problems. And the fact is, we don't like that we have problems. But, but here's, here's the idea. If you have a problem, then you are a candidate for a miracle. And this is, this is really good news. Because if you think, I, I have no problems, then, then you're not a candidate for God's miraculous work in your life. And here's the better news. If you have a little problem then you're a candidate for a little miracle. If you have a, a medium-sized problem, then, then you're a candidate for a medium-sized miracle. And if you have a big problem, an overwhelming problem where you're desperate and crying out to God for help like this father, then you are a candidate for a God-sized miracle. And this is the beautiful thing about how God is at work, even in your own life right now. See, a small miracle, a mid-sized miracle, a big miracle, they're no different for God. God can do anything he wants with any size problem he wants because if you take your problem and you hold it up next to God right now, that problem's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller because you realize he is, he is over all of these things. And he wants to surprise you and he wants to make you smile by, by answering your prayer and by divinely intervening in this problem. But, but notice the father, he says, he says, if you can, and some of your versions, Jesus repeats the question, if I can, if, if I can, yeah, yeah, if everything is possible for him who believes, and the response of the father is, then, then help my unbelief. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you're like, you know what, for that person I've been praying for, or that breakthrough that I'm longing for, I keep on just trying to breathe and just not give up, and, and maybe at one point, you, you had faith. I used to have faith. I used to believe. Or, or I want to believe, but I don't know how much I can believe in the face of the circumstances. I mean, I love his honesty. Maybe he believed in the past. Maybe it's painful for him to believe. Because hoping, he's hoped so many times his son could be set free. But it's been dashed. And the more you hope greatly and it's dashed, the more it hurts. The more it makes you wonder, does God even care? Does he even see? Does he even love me? And there's a beautiful picture of this help my unbelief prayer. It's Jesus talking about this, this mustard seed. If we just had the faith like the grain of a mustard seed that we could move a mountain. That, that God hearing our prayers could, could move that mountain. And so I hope that, that this cry of this desperate father encourages you. God, I believe but help the parts of me that don't believe. I just have a, a seed of faith, Jesus, that I've, I've just brought my son to you that you could do something. Though no one else has been able to do anything at all, then take this little grain of belief and do something amazing with it. You know, Spurgeon said about belief, he said, while, while men have no faith, they are unconscious of their belief. 
But as soon as they get a little faith, then they begin to be conscious of the greatness of their unbelief. Which means the closer we get to Jesus, the more we realize those areas that we do have a lack of faith. But Jesus is so patient with us in our unbelief. I mean, you can only pray this prayer, help my unbelief, if you believe in the first place. And so we're going to watch what Jesus does next, verse 25. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. This is like part of the scene that's even more chaotic. I mean, the whole crowd rushes toward this conversation that Jesus is having with his father. And when Jesus cast out the spirit, the, the whole crowd is rushing. It's like a circus. It's like a freak show. They just want to see what's going to happen next. It's not that they care about the son or the father or even care about Jesus. They just want to see the next thing. And then they see this boy still on the ground. And they're like, oh, I think Jesus killed him. It didn't get better. It, it actually got worse. And, and here's... Here's the second idea that we see about miracles, that the middle of a miracle can be messy. The middle of a miracle can be messy. That not all miracles happen like you pray and all of a sudden it happens. I mean, when we think miracle, we think instantaneous and and, and full miracle. But when you look at so many miracles in the Bible, a lot of them happen over time. And it's because God wants to teach a deeper lesson in the middle of the miracle. And that's where the mess is, and that's where so much of the good stuff is. I mean, Naaman, this general, he has to wash in the Jordan River seven times. Seven times in this dirty water to heal leprosy. And it's almost like God saying, hey, I was going to heal Naaman, but I want to teach him submission as he goes through the miracle. Or there's Miriam, the, the sister of Moses. And when she makes this crazy claim against Moses to go out into the desert for seven days to be cleaned and cleansed of her leprosy because God wants to teach her reverence. Not just that he can heal, he wants to teach her that that he is holy and and needs to be revered. You look at the the servants that that Jesus said to fill these water pots in John chapter 2. They filled these six pots of water. And the water doesn't turn to, to wine like in that moment as they're filling and they just have to learn to be obedient, to do all this hard work. And, and then as they participate in the miracle, this, this water turns into wine. We see as Jesus heals some blind men, one man that he, he healed only saw initially like a man, men that were walking around like trees. It was like this revelation, this healing that happened over moments, over time. John chapter 9, he spits in the ground and makes mud and puts on the man's eyes and makes him walk all the way back to the temple as someone's leading him. Now, why is he doing that? Because he wants to attract a crowd because he says to that man, your healing is going to bring glory to God. And so you start to see like the the mess, in the mess there's something beautiful. And I want to share with you a story from just a couple, a precious couple in our church family, Drew and Alice, because they went through something with their daughter, Ada. and, And it was a miracle, and it was a mess, and God taught them so much through that that we want you to hear their story. Take a look. My name is Alisar, and this is Drew. We have been married for six years. We have two beautiful children. They are miracle babies. We were told we probably wouldn't have children. We had our firstborn, Ada. She was about um, 14 months old when she just got very sick. We were changing diapers like 10 to 12 times a day. So we went to a ton of specialists. And there were no answers and no resolve. We had gone up to the altar and um, Pastor Chris and Pastor Jerry and their wives all laid hands on her and Drew and I just wept. The next morning she woke up so sick. We rushed Ada to the emergency room at Joe DiMaggio. Arriving in that ER was so surreal. It's like the last place you even imagine having to take your child. The doctor came in and he asked to talk with me. And he says, well, I got got some, you know, heavy news for you guys. Ada has a cancerous tumor in her stomach. How, like how, how does your perfect one-year-old 
um, mm -hmm. have cancer. When the news got out that Ada had cancer, the, the church really united and came together and became just an absolute force. I was getting like texts from people that lived all over the world, sending me screenshots of their phone to pray for Ada. It was in that moment where I just didn't feel alone any longer. I felt like an army behind us um, who were praying for things that I couldn't pray for. One stranger in our community, her daughters wanted to do a lemonade stand and raise money for Ada. And <laughs> the money that they raised, they wanted to give her gifts. And it was just like, why, Lord, like, how could you think of us so much in that moment? After four rounds of chemo, it was completely unresponsive. The tumor didn't even shrink a little bit. The doctor came and told us that she would now have a very high risk surgery. That was a moment of saying, it's literally up to you, God, to to show up and to do a move for us here. It was about the eight to 10 hour surgery. When yeah. the doctor came out and told us that he was able to remove all of the tumor, we were just like in shock. Ada's been recovering and she's fully like been healed from her surgery and even from her cancer. Yeah, no. We experienced a miracle as a family, but then also just seeing the church all the way back to that moment where the pastors were praying for us. That was the moment of healing. That was the moment that miracles were starting to happen. I don't know if you size a miracle from big to little, but we believe that there are so many more little miracles happening in other people's lives, whether that was increased faith, maybe that was growing in, in prayer. <laughs> we believe that what we experienced wasn't for us, God did this for, for our community and others around, that he's like, man, there's gonna be multiple miracles that happen. Mm -hmm. You know, pain and faith, they go together. We don't always think of it that way, but there's something about the way that God uses pain. He never wastes it. It always serves a greater purpose. Even as you think about the the desperation of, of Drew and Alice are praying, God, what's happening with our daughter? Why can't you just help it now? And we pray and it gets worse. Because God was going to heal Ada all along. But he wanted to take them on a journey and this entire community of faith on a journey of what does it mean to be generous for a little girl to do a lemonade stand, to buy gifts for, for their daughter? What does it mean for a whole host of people to pray, and, and he's building our faith together as we go through the pain and the desperation and the waiting and the, and the why not now and the, and the why not yet. And maybe that's, that's true in your life. You're, you're in the middle of a miracle, and it feels messy. It feels like, is God listening? Why, why hasn't God shown up yet? And we just know that in this story, and so many stories of the Scripture, that God is teaching us personal and deeper lessons. And I hope and pray that the miracle you're waiting for and the mess that you're in, you have this confident expectation that your God knows you and he loves you and he is at work in answering your prayer, even in a way that you might not understand. And so what, what happens in this moment with this man, he, he brings his son to the disciples. They can't heal him. He brings his son to Jesus who challenges his faith and then, and then cast out this demon and the boy falls down like he's dead and the whole crowd says like what, what, like he's dead like this is worse this is so much worse but verse 27 but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose and when he had come into the house his disciples asked him privately why couldn't we cast it out so Jesus said to them this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting this little boy is, experiences like a resurrection. Jesus has him rise up. He hands him to his father, and there's this amazing sort of celebration that happens. And then Jesus goes into the house, and his disciples go with him. And, and they're like, they're like well, why couldn't we cast out that demon? I mean, in Mark chapter 6, they had done this before. It wasn't like they had never healed or cast out demons before, but, but something was different here. And Jesus says that this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. And you could write down the simple idea, some miracles require prayer and fasting. And you might be asking yourself the question, why, why fasting? What's the significance 
of fasting? Well, there's a connection to an invisible power. And there's a release in the spiritual for sometimes when we, we offer just our physical obedience. Because we're not just spirits. We're not just bodies. We, we are body, soul, and spirit. And there's something that God, when he asks us to pray and fast, that connects with something in the heavenly that is beautiful and mysterious. But I want, want just to think about maybe the way that we pray. You know, sometimes we can say, well, you know what? I'm thankful and I'm grateful. But does that mean I have to sing when people worship? Or can I just do it in my mind? I, I'm, I want to thank God for what he did, but does that mean I have to raise my hand? You know, sometimes in worship, you should raise your hand. Sometimes in worship, you should sing with all your heart because, again, it's your, your body expressing what your mind is believing. Or, or maybe it's like the person who says, you know, I, I, I live in humble reverence to God, but, but I've, I, never, I never get on my knees because, because in mind, you know, I, I'm humble and, and I want to honor God, but there's something about physically getting on your knees to pray. There are people that say, you know, I, I'm generous. But when someone asks you, so when have you given when it was sacrificial, when it actually hurt you to help someone else? You're like, yeah, you see, every one of those beliefs all by themselves, they need this, this physical representation, some type of response of obedience. And God says this is one of the ways we do this, through, through fasting, where we choose not to eat. We, we withhold something for our body for a greater purpose. And we see this rhythm in Moses' life. Just want to give you three real quick. In, in Exodus chapter 3, uh, Moses uh, sees this burning bush, and God says, take off your sandals because the place you're standing is holy ground. There's a, something physical Moses has to do to represent that he sees God as holy and he wants to revere him. In, in Exodus chapter 17, Moses is at the top of a mountain. And there's a battle happening in the valley below. And every time he raises his hand, which has a staff in it, the people of Israel start to win. And every time his arms get tired, he brings his arms down, the Israelites begin to lose. And so Aaron and her, uh, they prop him up. They put a rock under him and they hold his arms up. And Israel experiences a great victory. What, what's happening? There's something happening in the physical that connects to the spiritual in a very powerful way. And God responds to that. And then we see in Exodus 34, Moses is praying and fasting for 40 days. And during those 40 days, God gives him the Ten Commandments and then says, I want to show you my glory. And Moses' face after he walks down that mountain is so glowing, so radiant that people have to put a veil over his face because there's something about a physical response in prayer, in worship, and seeking God. And so maybe there's, there's something more for you to do. Some miracles are going to require prayer and fasting. Just like Jesus fasted for 40 days. Just like Elijah fasted for 40 days. Just like Esther and Nehemiah needed some divine intervention. They prayed, they fasted. Just like Jehoshaphat said, there's no other way we're going to make it out of this. We're going to call a fast. We're all going to fast together. And that's part of why I think this 21-day fast is so timely during this time of coronavirus, during this uncertainty, as we all pray together, we humble ourselves, we seek God's face. He promises. He will answer. And he is the God who does above and beyond what we can ask or imagine. But just as important as fasting is the way that we pray when we fast. That we pray with an expectancy, that we pray with the humility, that we pray with this, this desire to say, uh, God's not a genie in a bottle. I rub the bottle and he does what I say. No, no, he's the God of the universe, but he loves to hear his children cry and cry in this way of expectancy. So I want to show you just an image of what that might look like. You know, we got these images from Mozambique this week of a whole classroom of kids praying for God's protection against the spread of coronavirus around the world. It, it hadn't hit them yet, but they're praying for us, take a look at what this holy expectation, this crying out to God looks like from the eyes and heart of a child.
So I wonder, when was the last time you prayed like that? I prayed like that. They're praying for people they've never met before. They're praying for us. And to me, when I saw that, that video, it was so convicting because sometimes my prayers can be about only what I can see. My wife, my family, my friends, our church, our city. And it was just humbling to see that they were praying with this fervency, this intercession for, for a breakthrough for, for across the world. And, and this is such a beautiful way to pray. So as we think about this miracle, we, we have problems. And there are other people that have problems. We're all candidates for miracles. How do we pray with this sense of expectancy? And so I'm going to close this, this last story. So I was listening to a pastor share a story. A, a couple of decades ago in Africa, there, there was this great drought. And, and all the crops were, were dying in this, in this village. The cattle was getting ready to die from dehydration, starvation. And, and the people were desperate. And this pastor, he calls for a prayer meeting. He calls for a prayer and fast. And so as people pray and as they fast, they gather at an appointed time at church. And they came for this express reason. They were coming to pray that God would make it rain. And there was something interesting about the prayer meeting that night. As about 100 people packed into this small church, there was only one girl who brought with her an umbrella. When you think about this, there's just something beautiful about this expression. God, we're praying for rain. And 99 other people came and didn't bring an umbrella. But, but I just know that my God is going to answer this prayer. And so, church, wherever you are, I want you to just think about this question for a second. Do you have a problem? Do you need a miracle? Maybe today you don't know Jesus. And you're like, I don't even know what would happen if I died. You, you can know Jesus today. And you can believe with this expectancy that he will answer your prayer if, wherever you are. If you just will acknowledge right now in this place, God, I feel separated from you. God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know I need salvation. This is why Jesus came. He came to die for you. He came to, to pay a debt you couldn't pay so that you could receive forgiveness. So that by receiving forgiveness and the grace of God, you could go to heaven. And you can be sheltered from the wrath to come. Maybe you're like, God, this, this whole situation is reminding me about the deep brokenness in my life. You know, a crisis on the outside can magnify brokenness on the inside. And maybe for you, there's even people in your own family, and the brokenness has sort of been revealed by this crisis. It's been made worse and magnified. And maybe right now you're just like, God, I, I need your breakthrough, your miracle in my family for that person, for forgiveness, for my trust in you, just that you'll provide for me, that you'll heal. And so we just want to take a moment and pray. We just want to pray a prayer of faith over you and, and let you know if you need prayer for any reason at all, you can call this number on the screen and someone will pray with you personally. If you're on our chat, you can ask right now for someone to, just to pray with you or pray over you for the problem that you have because God delights in answering the prayers of his kids. And so we're going to pray right now together as one church family. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We come to you with a holy expectancy that you will do above and beyond what we can ask or imagine because we know it's your power that's at work in us, the church. Jesus, we pray for those who don't know your love that you would draw them right now, even as they begin to pray a prayer and cry out to you and, and then call that number or start a chat. They could begin their journey, Jesus, with you. For those who are far away, that you would draw them back. For those who need healing, for those who are living in fear, Father, that you would begin to save and deliver and heal and work in supernatural ways. This is our prayer today. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, church, we want to close with this final thought. And it comes from the book of Numbers. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing that God commanded the priests to pray over the people. Church, I want to say it over you. Here's the prayer.
priest's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is our prayer for you. And now we're going to sing it over you and sing it with you so that today as you finish our time together in service, you can know that this blessing of God, this favor of God is going to rest on you and go with you. God bless you. And we will see you next time. children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his savor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around
upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Be encouraged by that, by the fact that he gives us peace. So let us just rest in that. We love you guys. Hey, Calvary family, wasn't it so great to be together today? We got to worship as a church family and be in God's word. Now remember, if this was your first time checking out Calvary, we invite you to text the word new to 3352 or visit calvaryftl.org slash new. Thanks so much for joining us. We do pray that God blesses you and keeps you as you go about your week. We love you and we'll see you next time. Hi, my name is Ananda, and I have the privilege of serving at our North Lauderdale campus. So shout out to our North Lauderdale family. I'm here with Scotty and Forrest, and we're just ready to worship the Lord together. So wherever you are, just worship with us. Come on, let's sing, There is a Name. There is a name above all. There is a king who took our place. Now we are sons, though we were slaves. Adopted through the Father's grace. Freedom rising, our burden has been lifted. We are shy.
we continue to sing and we sing. Well, I raise it hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise it hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise it hallelujah you're at, we sing this out. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. We sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. We sing a little the man. 
Father, in the midst of whatever we're walking, Lord, I pray that we remember, God, that you were faithful before and you are still faithful now. No matter the fear, no matter where it is, Lord, that we remember your faithful knowing, your faithfulness, God. And we can lift up our hands and just sing our hallelujah unto you, God. And we can sing in the storm and we can sing wherever we are, God. Whether we're in our houses, in our offices, Lord, that our hearts can just consistently praise you. That our hearts can consistently just raise our praises to you, God. For we are free, God. We are free from fear. We are free from panic, God. For you shout deliverance over us, God. So remind us of that today, Lord. And receive our worship to you, Lord. Receive it all, because it's all for you and only for you. And it's in your name that we pray. And we all say, even wherever you are, amen.
hearts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So as we lift our song today, let's be reminded that's the God that we serve and the God that loves us and we are his sheep. Let's love on him this morning. Sing this out with us. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes. Heaven comes to fight for me. Over you, you sing a little louder. 
Hey, when you're unafraid, we're just gonna sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. You're gonna sing a little louder. Oh, louder than the unbelief. Oh, sing a little louder. So we we'll lift our song, we we'll lift our voice to remind our souls of who you are and all you've done. It's a simple melody, I want you to sing with me. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your life. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Not a chance, not a chance. Sing it over your feet today. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. If you learn stronger, one more time, come on. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. So when we sing mountains move, when we sing the seas part, when we sing, we see miracles, we see miracles. So we surrender tonight, today, this morning, let's surrender our fear 
Surrender our stress, surrender our anxiety, our worry of what's to come because our future is in his hands. He holds us in his hands. We do not have to fear for he is with us. Even through the hard, even through the pressing, even through what feels like crushing, he's making such beautiful things right now. He's reminding us how to rest. He's reminding us that he is all that we need and to sit by his water and to be nourished and be fed. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. Let's sing that again. In the crushing, he's with you. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hands. Let this be your heart. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. Came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making. You are, yes, you are. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. You are breaking new ground. So make me your vessel. Make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Would you, Lord, Jesus, bring Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Because where there is new wine, there is new power. There is new freedom. And the kingdom is here. I lay down my old things to carry your new fire today. Today, let that be our hearts cry. Cause where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom, and the kingdom is here. I lay down my old claims, carry your new fire today. So let's ask him. So make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I 
of the darkness, bringing it to light in our hearts, bring it to light, what we're fearful of, bring it to light, what we are not controlling, let us know you're in control. Future is held. Future is held in your hands. Sickness and disease bound your name. Fear and worry, anxious thoughts bound your name. Hopelessness bows at your name. you with us. You hold the whole world in your hands. Oh, we're in it together with you, God. So help us surrender. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give, and I will ever love and trust him in his presence again. Let's give it to Jesus. And all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give and I will ever love and trust him in his presence day
Hey, good morning. Thanks for being with us this morning, waking up a little early on a Saturday to chase the heart and the presence of God. Uh, my name's Drew Eels. I have the honor and I have the privilege to, to serve our young adult ministry here at Calvary Chapel. And I'm thrilled to be with you guys this morning. Again, this is uh, my good friend, Laura. And uh, again, we, we both have the honor of serving our, our young adult ministry. So before we get started, let's be family instead of strangers. And you're like, what's that mean? Well, I'm saying if it's on Instagram or it's on Facebook, why don't you guys just type hi? Why don't you say hi to each other? Why don't you give us some wave emojis or maybe the love sign emojis? Well, let's not be strangers here. Say what's up to each other as we are going to chase the heart of God together as a family, not as individuals here tonight, but as one united together. So go ahead, say what's up to someone just in the next 10, 15 seconds. And then we're going to get started here. Let me tell you, I'm encouraged. I was on Twitter and a guy posted something about Paul. And we're talking, we're thinking about isolation and some that could, something that can even make us to feel defeated as the church uh, almost immediately. And they're talking about how Paul was in isolation, yet the word of God went forth in power and in might. It wasn't hindered. And if you look back throughout history, every time that the church where it seemed like the church was going to be hindered, I believe that the Lord used that time in power. So right now, we're not just logging on, you know. Right now, roots are growing deeper in community as we speak. The church is growing and digging roots into its Father right now in this moment. So powerful things are at hand right now in the 7 a.m. on Saturday. If I think it's Saturday, all the days have kind of meshed together. Give me a thumbs up if all the days are kind of meshed together because, man, you have been at home every day this week. A couple days ago, I couldn't fall asleep. It's like 2 a.m. So I opened my iPad. I was getting in the Word. And I ended up in Numbers 13. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in, in Numbers 13. And I'll tell you what, this chapter shook me. It shook me. It's all I've been thinking about for the last two, three days. So here's the thing. Like, the Lord was talking to Moses. He's like, yo, Moses, I got something good in store for your people, for my children, the Israelites. But here's what I want you to do. I need you to send some men. I need you to go spy on the land of Canaan. And not only do I need you to spy, but I'm just letting you know, I'm, I'm going to give this to you. Here's a promise that I have for you. So Moses, he went to the 12 tribes. He took one man from each tribe. He's like, I need you to go to Canaan. I need you to spy out, see the land. So 12 men went to Canaan. 12 men saw the same thing. 12 men experienced the same surroundings, the same weather, the same climate, whatever it was. But yet when they came back to report to Moses and the people and the children of Israel, there was two incredibly different perspectives. There was two incredibly different responses. One that was of fear, one that was of trust and victory. Ten men came back and they said, the people of Canaan look so strong and of power. The buildings in Canaan, they look so tall and they look like giants. So those 10 men who came back, before they could even lift a weapon, they were already defeated. They were already in loss because of their lack of faith in God and what he has promised and who he is and what he's able to do and the moves he's able to make. They were already in defeat. They were already in loss.
because of their lack of faith. Let me tell you about two guys. Let me tell you about a dude named Caleb. Let me tell you about a guy named Joshua. These two men came back. And we're going to read what they say. We're in Numbers 13. So if you follow along in your Bible, I, I encourage you guys to, to read this whole chapter, man. I really believe it's going to bless you. I believe it's going to convict you. I believe it's going to encourage you. I believe it's going to draw you closer to God today. We're going to be in verse 30. Simply, it says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Come on. Verse 31, But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who saw it, saw in it, are men of great stature. Let's continue in 33. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Man, you got giants in front of you? Ask yourself that question. Say it out loud so you can hear it too. What are the giants we're seeing in front of us right now, in this moment, in our current situation? Man, some of you might have woke up and you read the news, and you're, you're shaking right now. And you feel like this is a giant. You're like, man, I don't know how we're going to continue because everything seems so uncertain. And when I read the news and I'm looking for some good news, all I'm receiving is bad news. Maybe the giants have been, man, you're a mother at home. You have kids and they're going crazy. <laughs> and you're like, Lord, I don't even know how I'm going to get through this because they're just saying this is just the start of some isolation here. Maybe a giant is that you had to leave school, and right now it's a little difficult because you're online, and you need some wisdom. You feel defeated. What you've been chasing feels totally out of reach right now. Maybe you were in this calling, this purpose that the Lord had for you job-wise, and you literally lost your job right now this week, maybe even yesterday. And the dreams that you had professionally seem absolutely impossible and maybe even for a lot of us including myself it seems that this season of life is just absolutely unbearable so let me tell you we got good news and it's not my words but it's what the gospel does in us and what the lord does for us right now in this moment and i want to encourage us that we're not going to be like the 10 but we're going to be like caleb and joshua that we're going to be in complete confidence of him amongst and amidst the giants that are in front of us. We're not going to be people in defeat this morning. No. We're not going to be people in loss. We're going to boldly trust God and say, I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to abide in you. I'm not going to lead on my own understandings. I think for us as children of God, when we have giants and things that seem unbearable and possible to live through, I think the Lord allows us and gives us the opportunity to see through the adversity, to see through the things that are hindering us, to see through loss, and to see ahead to a joy that is there, to see ahead to a peace that we're able to live in right in this moment to see ahead to a victory that he's already given. We're actually not underdogs. Why don't you tell yourself, I'm not an underdog in this moment. If you're in the chat, why don't you say, we're not underdogs in this moment. Type it in the chat. We live victoriously, not because of anything we could possibly do, not because of our intelligence, not because of our network, not because we're fun people. Is because of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, died a terrible death. He bore our sins. But that's not what the story is. He, he rose up. And because of that, now we live in victory. 
in our souls and our salvation, but we also live in victory in this moment right here, right now. Because in him is the victory. We're in him. We're chasing him. We're after the heart of God this morning. Let me tell you something. There's no one on earth more powerful than a child of God who boldly trusts God. I'm going to say that again. There's no one more powerful on this earth than those children of God who boldly trust God. So we're going to be people, and I'm not even thinking about a week ahead. I'm thinking about 7 to 12 p.m. today. <laughs> All right? We're going to take a baby step. And we're going to live in the power of God. We're going to live as people that live in victory, that can experience joy, that can experience a peace that surpasses all understanding. Even if you've experienced loss, even if you've experienced defeat, even if you're in fear and doubt. And here's what we're going to do in this moment. We're going to pray. And what I want to do in this first little prayer time, I want you to ask God to reveal, if you're in fear, doubt, anxiety, Maybe you're just trying to grip everything right now and you're trying to fix and do everything you can. You're trying to find some way you can control your life. And the Lord is like, this ain't it. Let me be the one in control. I want you in this moment to ask God, what are the giants, what are the things that seem more powerful than God? And I want you to lay them and say, Lord, I'm giving this to you. These are lies. I'm trusting you and who you are. You work all things together for good. We love you. We believe we have purpose from you. So in this moment, in this next 10 minutes, the Lord is going to sing over. And I'm just letting you know, we worship from a place of victory. We worship from a place of freedom in this moment right now. So if you're in the chat, and if you're with family, maybe your son or daughter there, bring them. Like, be real. Let's lead people. Let's be together. In the chat, tell them what those giants are. Let's pray for one another right now together in this moment, right? Again, we're not strangers. We're family, so we're ready to pray for one another. Pray for your family members. Tell them what you're afraid of. Tell them what's bringing you down. It takes some vulnerability. The Lord is able to do a work when we're able to lay that stuff down. The Holy Spirit is going to be your comforter in the vulnerability. Take 10 minutes. Let's pray for that. Lord, these are lies. Lord, I'm going to trust in you. I want to be a Caleb and Joseph. Give me the eyes to see, the discernment to know. So I want you to take 10 minutes. I want you to pray for each other.
Even now you're moving Even now in our rooms today Bringing life back Bringing hope back to our hearts You're giving peace like no other time before. And you're healing broken hearts. Oh, you're healing broken hearts. And you're healing fearful hearts. healing hurting hearts just tell him everything just lay it down at his feet right now in this moment. Nothing is too big for him. Nothing is too hard for him. Just come to him with whatever it is that's burdening you, that's holding you back from feeling that peace and that freedom. to hear today all your fear and all your pain he wants to hear today Let him nourish you today. Let's sit by his waters. Let's be fed. Let's be fed today.
Help us to give that love away. The love you lavish on us. Help us give that love away. Show others your heart. Help us give that love away. he's bringing someone to your heart right now for you to pray for someone that's far from the Lord maybe doesn't know him at all and this time might be wrecking them we are the light of the world a commandment that he's given us the greatest commandment to love one another as he has loved us let's do that to a mind who to love and pray give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, great are your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you holy So some of us were thinking, we're like, man, like, Lord, I, I want to trust you. I want to, I want to rest in you. I don't know about you, but I know sometimes for me, I think rest is maybe watching Netflix or doing a hobby. Really, like, it's this escapism that we think is going to bring us rest from reality. 
I just want to challenge that, and I'm challenging myself. My rest belongs and is in God. So, Lord, we're not trusting the things that will never bring us rest. Spiritually, even physically, mentally. We're going to trust you. We're going to rest in you. We're going to abide in you. He's our shepherd. He leads us to streams of quiet, peaceful, restful waters. He's our shepherd. I believe, though, we need to be able to follow. And in this moment, I believe that we're asked to be teachable. If he's supposed to be a shepherd and a teacher to us. For some of you that are experiencing adversity in this moment, maybe this moment hasn't been like your major or big giant, but you've been experiencing giants and adversity way before this pandemic even started. Maybe God is actually using this moment. I say this compassionately and, and empathetically to what, what's happening in our time right now. But God is using this moment to grab your attention, to literally splash some water on the face and say, you need to depend on me. Here I am. This is your defining moment to draw near. That God would use adversity, that God would use affliction, that God would use pain, that God, he's able to use loss literally to be a catalyst and a launching pad into calling, into our purpose, into what he has for us. That's what he has for you. That's what this time is able to be in your life. That we could be filled and be more of Jesus. This literally can change your 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock today. So in this moment, we're going to ask, Lord, how can and what does it look like to rest? Lord, I'm chasing after your heart. I want to depend on you. I was just praying with Bobby. We were talking about, man, I think moments like these bring out big prayers. And I'm not saying big prayers in, in words or vocabulary, but big prayers in dependence. Big prayers in surrender. So we're going to pray big. And I think big looks a lot like maybe not just putting your head down, muscling through, trying to get through it in your own might. But big prayers are going to look like our faces are on the ground. I don't know if you're able to. Let's get on our knees. I'm going to do it too. We're going to get on our knees. Lord, I'm not capable. That's what I'm praying. But you know who is? We're going to say you are more than capable. More than capable to get us through today more than capable to get us through this moment. And not only just to get through, but Lord, we believe that when you give us the, the bread of adversity, the waters of affliction, like in Isaiah it says, you're not going to hide yourself. You're going to guide us. Lord, make us teachable. Pray for a discerning heart. And in praying for a discerning heart, where are the areas that you need to be open to teaching? It's going to hurt a little bit, let me tell you that. Why don't you type in the comments to one another. It's going to hurt a little bit. But I tell you what, there's going to be more comfort through it because the Lord is with us in it. Let's pray for discernment. Let's pray for things we're going to surrender. Let's pray for just ways that we want the Lord just to do a work and a move for us. So why don't you, in the comments right now, on Instagram, on Facebook, when the Lord reveals that thing of what you need to be teachable in, how you're trying to depend on him more, what you're laying down, again, why don't you share that in the comments so they can pray over those things for you. Maybe it's over control. It's over wants or needs. Maybe you've been selfish. I'll tell you what, man. I had a conversation with my wife. She's like, you are selfish right now in this moment. Ouch, right? My daughter would say, that's a boo-boo. <laughs> but right now, the Lord's going to comfort. The Lord's going to work those things out. Let's pray together, okay? Pray for one another. What are you dependent on? What are you putting down? 
What are you hopeful for? What do you believe the Lord's doing with your life? In what ways are you trying to be teachable? That's what we're asking for. That's what we're praying for. Share it so people can pray for you specifically. As we close out this morning, just in our final minutes and moments together, I truly believe that this can be and maybe has been literally a turning point, a defining moment for right now and for you in this season. If you read our text again in Numbers 13, the thing I love what happened with Caleb is that he silenced the crowd. And here's what I loved about that, because what was happening was fear and doubt. And what I know is that what trust and what God is able to do in fear and doubt is to silence those things in our life. Literally make them quiet. Because if you read later, when the guys that are faithless, that are defeated, that are in fear and doubt and felt overcome, they literally spread that to everyone around. We... I believe, have the ability as children of God, being vessels, being able to be a light in this world. And like we said earlier, that there's no one more powerful on this earth than children of God who boldly trust God. 
And us boldly trusting God, I be I really truly believe, believe that we're able to spread hope instead of fear and doubt. I believe that we're going to be people that lift one another up. That we're able to experience thankfulness in the loss and the chaos right now. So let's pray for one another in this defining moment, maybe in this turning point for us in your life, maybe. Or maybe just in this hour. So here's what I want us to pray for. I'll be praying on my own, but we have some specific ones that we want to pray for that we got from the chat in the comments. So we're going to pray for Damon. We're going to pray for his sons. One who's a prodigal, the other one who is a believer who's stuck out of the country. So we're going to pray for Damon and his family, okay? We're going to pray for Diane's daughter who lost her job. We're going to pray for doors to open. We're going to pray for provision. We're going to pray for wisdom, direction, discernment, strength in the midst of loss. We're going to pray for those that are living alone. We're going to pray for the lonely. We're going to pray for those who have felt isolated and now even feel more isolated. We're going to ask that the Lord surround them with the love of God and community. And I believe we need to ask God to show us and give us a responsibility and a heart and a discernment to at least find one of those that we can even send a text to a Facebook message to, an Instagram, an Instagram DM to. So I pray that if that's not you, I pray that the Lord gives you discernment to bring up one in your heart, in your mind, in some way. We're going to pray for Angelina. We're going to pray for restoration in her family. We're going to pray over our country, over our church, over our community, over your neighborhood, over the fear, anxiety, depression, and suicide that exists or might be tormenting and tempting. We're going to pray for those that God is calling to rise up to be a leader in their family, in their job, and in their community. So write those requests down. I hope you have. I hope you posted them in the chats. Let's pray for one another as we close out. And I'm going to come up and I'm going to pray us out in literally the next moments.
Instagram, Facebook, let's close it out in prayer together. Lord, we're grateful for defining moments that can shift, shake, and change a community, a family, an individual, even a nation, God. We are dependent. We are in need of you. I think it's okay to say we are totally incapable to do this on our own. We are so glad that we are children of God, of the one who has already claimed victory over our lives and souls, who has changed the narrative from death to life in us, who is in the midst of chaos and uncertainty, changing the narrative to purpose, thankfulness, peace that surpasses all understanding. God, we're not going to be people of doubt and fear today. I pray that you give us verses that remind us who we are in you. I pray that you remind us who you are, what you've done. So we pray for everyone that's in the chat, who's logging on, who's viewing this, that this will increase our faith, increase our trust, increase our love to you. Thank you for this moment and opportunity that we have. God, we lift up those who are sick. We lift up those that are broken and alone. We pray a mighty move and a miracle of healing over them. We pray for those who are stubborn. Maybe some are in the chat. I'm raising my hand. I'm one. And maybe you're trying to break us to get our attention. We're praying just for strength. Give them strength that they might be able to surrender. We're praying for the moms and for the dads, the grandmas and the grandpas and the people that are just feeling completely gassed because of the situation. They're feeling totally defeated and out of energy just of what's been asked of them. May you sustain them in this moment. God, what an honor it is to say that we love you and that we are yours. I pray that we take this one hour, this 7 to 8 a.m., and I pray that it will literally affect the rest of this month, the rest of our day, the rest of our family. That's what you're able to do in a moment like this. We love you in your name. Amen. Facebook, Instagram, we love you guys. If you guys can, why don't you say love you to everyone in the chat? Why don't you give little I love you emojis in the chat? So just let them know that you're thinking of each other, that you love each other, you're for each other, you're backing each other up. I hope that you wrote some prayer requests down of some people in the chat so that you can keep them on your mind, not only on your mind, but in your heart and in your mouth when you're praying to God. We love you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Come to service, hop on, join us online. We're so excited. We love you guys.
Staying faithful through giving is as easy as one, two, three with PushPay, Calvary's electronic giving system. Number one, visit calvaryftl.org or choose from two ways with your mobile device. Either text GIVE to 31352 to get a link or go to our mobile app and tap GIVE. Then once you're on our giving page, select your campus from the drop-down menu. Two, fill out all the information such as giving amount, giving type, and whether or not you want this gift to repeat. Three, choose to add bank account info. Why? Giving directly from your bank account maximizes your gift. Giving with a bank card or credit card can take up to 3% of your gift for a credit card company. Giving from your bank directly to Calvary Chapel allows your gift to have the greatest impact. Look, you just gave.